Well, today we are uh, finishing up our series, playing the game. We're going to be talking about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And I know something about that a little bit this past week. I was invited uh, from somebody in our church has a boat. And he said, hey, why don't you come on out wakeboarding, bring your you know, kids. So I invited my kids and one of them was able to make it. And <clears throat> so I'm, we're out there, we're wakeboarding, beautiful day. It's, all, it's this past Monday. And my, my son, my oldest son, he's really good. He's like flying through the air and doing all these things. And he kind of inspires me. You know, I think, hey, you know, I'm really not 53. What do I think? I'm, I'm 23. So I, uh, I, I actually made it from wake to wake a couple of times. I'm feeling pretty good. That's the victory of defeat. I mean, the victory of uh, the thrill of victory part. And then, uh, and then I, he's telling me, hey, I can actually go higher if I just change what I'm doing a little bit. He says, what you need to do is when you, when you approach the wake and you're ready to go over that crest, he goes, you're crouching too much. You need to like straighten up and like, you know, like go straight right when you hit that, you'll pop even higher. And I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a glutton for punishment. You know, I'm thinking to myself, higher? That sounds good, you know? So, so I do that. I, I approach it. I come in real fast and I, I, I go straight. And the excitement and the thrill of the moment, I forgot to bend my, na- my knees again. So I come back down. I didn't actually make it across the weight, which probably would have been better. Uh, so I hit this thing and with my legs locked. And uh, so that's really not the way you're supposed to do it. Just in case you're wondering, you're supposed to have like supple knees. And, and so I hit it really hard and I, I hear things go wrong and I feel things go wrong. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm done, you know. And I'm, you know, they're both coming back around to get me. And, you know, I'm like blowing bubbles, you know. And Samuel says, whenever I blow bubbles, he goes, you're like a little baby. Whenever you blow bubbles, I know something's bad's happened. Because that's like my fetal position thing, you know. <clears throat> so I've been limping all, this is the first morning. I limped all day yesterday. This is the first morning I'm, I'm able to walk around really without a limp. It's just been a slow, painful agony of defeat, you know. I mean, there's the... Just to, it didn't feel good to go down like that, but also physically. Well, in the Olympics, we've been watching that, and there's been some pretty big moments. If, if, you've, if you didn't catch some of it, one of them, of course, was Michael Phelps. He won all, I think, what did he have? 23 Olympic gold medals, right? And this, you know, so I think he's retiring, but this is, he's made 23, this Olympics. Then you had uh, Simone Biles, the most medals of an American gymnast in a single Olympics. Usain Bolt, of course, greatest sprinter of all time, nine gold medals. He says he's retiring for sure as well. There's also some defeats. One of the significant defeats was Kerry Walsh Jennings and uh, April Ross, they were expected to get the gold medal. Kerry's always gotten the, the gold medal for, for a number of Olympics, and, and they lost to the, ja- to, to the, uh, to the uh, Brazilians, right? Because they had the crowd going, and, and, uh, and, and they ended up with a bronze. But it was a, it was, it was a big defeat for them. Another one that was a big, uh, a big defeat was a disqualification. William Boloshian, this past Monday night, the night I also had my, my injury, so we were kind of in this pain together. He was, he was ready to run in the 100-meter hurdles, and he just sp- sprints out just a millisecond early. It's a false start, but in, in the Olympics, a false start, you're disqualified. Four years of hard work down the tubes, doesn't even get a chance to run. Now, if you saw it, he just he goes on sobbing and sobbing. It, just, it was awkward even to, to, to watch. It was, so, it was so heartbroken. So there's both the highs and the lows. And our Christian faith, we, when we're in our race, our spiritual race, we have highs and lows. We, have ex- we can have highs where we're on the mountaintop. We're excited. And then next thing you know, we're in the trenches. We don't know how we even got there sometimes. We're just down in the low place of life. And we're wondering, how do I ever get out of here? Now, we're going to look at Mark 14. We're going to look at, I want you to turn to Mark, Mark 14. We're going to look at some of the story of Peter there. And uh, Peter experienced that. He had the highs. 
He was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and the great amazing things that were happening where Jesus was transfigured in front of him and and in Caesarea Philippi when God gave him this amazing anointed revelation of who Jesus was and Jesus just just calls Peter out in, in a great way. And, and But he also experienced some, some lows and where he thought, how do I get out of this place? How did I get so far away? And and that's, that's sad when you're in that place. You know, the Bible says, Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. Give us the joy we once had. When you're far away, when you're not near, the, you don't have the thrill of victory. You're in the agony of defeat. This is the prayer. God, restore me. How do I get back to the place that I am? And when, by looking at Peter's life, since he's such a great illustration of this for us, we see some common themes. Common themes that Peter did that when we do those same things, we end up with the agony of defeat. We end up on the sidelines. We end up disqualified. Now, in this story, Peter, along with the other disciples and Jesus, they're in the upper room. This is the night before Jesus is going to, this is Passover. They're celebrating Passover meal. This is the night before Jesus is going to be arrested falsely accused, beaten, crucified, all those. This is the night before that. And they're having a meal together. And they're, they're, they're laying around on this, on this table. They, they, they were reclining on the floor and Jesus shocks everyone there because he says, he says, one of you, one of you right here, my closest friends, my disciples, one of you is going to betray me. And they're all thinking, how is this even possible? Somebody's going to be a traitor. Who is it? And, and they start asking that question. Is it me? Is it me? And they're, they're all kind of doing some introspection. Well, Peter, he, he, he comes out kind of in this braggadocious way. And he goes, it's not me. I mean, it might be one of these guys. Let's, let's Jesus, you and I, let's evaluate. Who could it be? Because it's not me. He says, everybody, everybody may stumble in their faith, but I will not. And you can almost feel this where he's just saying, you know, I'm above that. I'm above that. And this is the first, the first warning to be careful of is overconfidence. Overconfidence, thinking that we can do it on our own. Thinking that it'll never happen to us. Anytime you say it to somebody, you know, well, look at what happened to them. That would never happen to me. You're actually, you're, you're, first thing, you're wrong. Second thing, you're in a, you're in a danger zone because it, it's, the truth is, in the right circumstances, any of us are capable of any kind of sin. And so we've got to kind of humbly walk with that attitude. We're not above other people. We're part of the fallen humanity. All of us are. So all of us have to have this, this mindset. Hey, I gotta, I, those things could happen to me if I'm not careful. I need, to, I, need to, you know, I need to walk with humility. Notice it says, you are wrong to think you are better than others when you really aren't. Paul says that in Galatians. And then the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? He's saying we lie to ourselves. We, we convince ourselves things that aren't true about us. We're not even sure why we do what we do. How in the world would we know why other people do what they do? So he says you, that's, that's part of the, the, uh, the problem with trying to figure all that stuff out and why we do the things we're not, we're, we're not happy with and we're, we're, we're ashamed of. Proverbs 16, 18 says, a proud attitude. See, so he says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. I, I like the King James, the haughty spirit. I don't really use that language, do you? you, you how often do you go to somebody and say, that's kind of a haughty spirit you got there. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't really talk like that, right? But we are talking about, when, what, what he's saying here is he's talking about you know, this overinflated ego. Ego stands for edging God out. You know, I'm, I don't need God. I can do it on my own. I'm, and, and that's, there should be a caution with that. Second thing that causes us to, to end up in the agony of defeat is laziness. When we're lethargic, we, sh- we let go of, of habits that, that help strengthen us, spiritual disciplines. <clears throat> We stop praying, we stop reading the Bible, we stop giving, we stop attending church. All those things, those should be a warning light. Now, here we see Peter, he he, um, gets tired, truthfully. 
Jesus, after the supper, they, they all go into the Garden of Gethsemane, and then Jesus takes three of the close James, John, and Peter, and he says, why don't you come with me? I'm going to go pray. And then he has them set, and he goes, why don't you be praying for me? I'm going to go, and I'm going to be, you know, he knows what's coming. He knows he's going into this excruciating uh, event of being uh, uh, tortured by the guards and Pilate and eventually crucified. He knows what's coming. And so he's praying, and, 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 but Peter gets tired. He comes back, and he looks at Peter, and Peter's asleep. He, goes, he wakes him up. Hey, listen, I, I asked you, this is, you know, can you pray for me? You know, he, he leaves, and he comes back. Peter's pray, he's sleeping again. This is his problem. Is he just keeps falling asleep. And Jesus finally says, couldn't you stay awake with me for one hour? And so what happens is, is he's just, when, when we drop our guard, when, we, when, we, when, we're, when we're not vigilant, we're, we're more susceptible to, to sin. We're more susceptible to temptation. And we've got to be careful of that, that we have to be vigilant. We, we can't let... Uh, fatigue get us. And this is what happens all the time to people that, that they, uh, they, they, they blow it majorly. I've seen it in many years of ministry and I talk to them and, and what happens is people get under stress. They, 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 they start, they're not sure how to, uh, co- to uh, cope with the stress. And so they, they, they stop they don't pray like they need to be praying. They don't get the rest they need to be getting. And they end up fatigued. And when you're fatigued, you're more susceptible. And next thing you know, you're in trouble. You don't even realize it. Notice this verse in Matthew 6, 41. He says, watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. Fatigue lowers our defenses. So we've got to be, we've got to be aware of that. And say, well, I'm not gonna, I, I don't want to fall into that because that's just going to cause me problems. Number three is the fear of disapproval. What other people will think of me? You know, will they reject me? Will they not like me? Will I not be invited to the party? Will, I, will they not follow me on social media? I mean, it's very important to me that people like me. You know, so there's this fear of rejection. I don't want to be harassed for my faith. I don't want to be uh, ridiculed because I'm a Christian. Now, here's what happened to Peter after Jesus was arrested. Notice there in Mark 15, 54, it says, Peter followed him at a distance. So you get the, get the picture here. Jesus is arrested the, and, and he's being taken off by these, by, the, by these guards. Peter's just far away enough so he won't be associated with Jesus. Follows him at a distance. Is, does that describe you? Do you follow Jesus? You're, you're, you're a Christian, but you don't want to really be associated too much with Christ. You know, you don't want to be connected and, oh, wow, that person's, you know, loves Jesus. And, you know, you, you want a little bit, but you don't want to be considered like a zealot. Uh, you know, somebody who's, who's uh, a holy roller and all these things that are associated with somebody who really puts, you know, puts Christ first in their life. And so you just kind of keep Jesus at a distance. I don't want all that, that's, that, that stuff that makes me look too weird. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to be able to blend in with everybody. One of the things that causes us to slip away from God. This is when we're ashamed of being around him, being associated with Jesus. You know, we have our Bible app open and, and, you know, at home or at work or whatever, and somebody comes in and we close it real quick. Don't want anybody to see I'm reading the Bible. You know, back in the day when people carried Bibles with them, you know, like the old-fashioned ones with made of paper and all, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> They, they kind of stand out. Those Bibles didn't look like other books. I mean, some of them did, but most of them didn't. They had like gold leaves. The covers looked different. And if you had it out, people noticed. Hey, what's that? The Bible? Oh, you're one of those. And you, you had to kind of just put your stuff out there. I believe in Christ. I, I, yeah, I, I believe in what the Bible says. And there's a lot of people see because of the barrage of the media and, and, and it just people are afraid of being ridiculed. They're afraid of that. You know, somebody says, why don't we pray? And you're in a restaurant. Oh, you're not one of those, are you? Pray. And I don't know if I want to pray in public. People might know I believe in God. You know, it's just, it's, it's just being ashamed. I don't want to be associated with that, that Christian group. And that's, that's unfortunate because what happens is when we 
fear disapproval, when we're ashamed of being connected to, to Christ in the body of Christ, that's a slippery slope of ends up where we end up in a bad place in our life. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fearing people is a dangerous trap. He says it's a trap. You get snared in that. Mark 8, 38, Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me, in my words, he's talking about here on earth, I will be ashamed of him before the holy angels and my Father in heaven. Now, Jesus isn't trying to shame you or make you feel bad. He's just saying, hey, listen, I'm not ashamed of you. Why would you be ashamed of me? You know, why, why would you be ashamed of me? Just because the world does it? Just because of all the sitcoms and the movies that make Christians look bad and the script writers and they've, they've done that to you where you're ashamed of being a Christ follower? Don't let that happen. It says, don't, don't be ashamed of me. You know, Revelation 21, 8, interesting, gives a list and puts of, 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 pro, of problem issues and lists cowardness right next to murder and adultery. It says those sins are in the same category. When we're ashamed of Christ, that's a problem. And that'll lead us into a bad place. And we want to avoid that. Number four is convenience. Convenience. So many times we're looking for the easy way, the comfortable way. What's convenient? What's not too difficult? It doesn't cramp my style. Peter, this happened to him, Mark 14, 4, says, Peter, follow Jesus from a distance. That's the first half. We already looked at that verse. Second one is, is then he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. This is amazing. One of the 12, one of the original disciples is hanging out with the group that's going to crucify Jesus because he's cold, because he doesn't want to be alone. You know, I mean, here they are. They're, these are the people that are going to, to beat Jesus and, and, and whip him and crucify him. He's hanging out with him. He just wants to be one of the boys. Hey, you guys, what are you doing? Ah, oh, we're just drinking some beer around the fire. You know, they don't know who this guy is because he's hung out at a distance. He didn't want to be associated with Jesus. Come on over, guy. Sure, what do you got some, some beer there? Sure, he's drinking beer, hanging out with, partying. He wants convenient Christianity. Because sometimes it's, it's tough being a Christ follower. And so when we look for convenience, when we look for the easy way, that leads us into a ditch. It leads us to be disqualified. It leads to all kinds of problems. And there's a pattern that happens when people, they're actively involved in their faith and then they slip away. I mean, I've seen it for years. We, Sharon and I started this church 21 years ago. I've been in ministry for 30 years. And I've just seen people that, you know, they're short-term disciples. They come in, they get excited, they're all fired up, and then in a year or two, they're gone. You know, like, what happened? You know, they're just gone off the map, off the grid. And there's a pattern that happens. It always starts with their giving. They're all excited, and the first thing they know is you notice they don't really, they don't financially give anymore. Why? Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there is your heart. He says that that is like a thermometer. It's like a spiritual EKG. How are you doing with your giving? That's, Jesus says, that's, there's no better uh, indicator than that. That's why that always goes first. Then they stop praying. Next thing you know, they stop attending. And then next thing you know, they're out of the race. They're gone. And so you want to avoid that trend. Don't be looking for convenient Christianity. Romans 8, 1 tells a great story of how God responds when we're in that bad place, when we're, when we're in the agony of defeat, we're not succeeding. We're not in a victory, a place of victory. Here's how God responds. He responds how he always responds to his believers that, that, uh, that have fallen down, that are in sin. It's through grace. Romans 8 one says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now circle that word, no, that's an important word. There is no condemnation. That word there is the strongest word in Greek for no. It means no, no, never, impossible, won't happen. He says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's good news. No condemnation at all. Now this promise isn't for everybody. It's for those who are in Christ Jesus. People who have not put their faith in Christ, this promise isn't for them. 
But for those who are, have put their faith in Christ, he says, there is no condemnation. Now, he doesn't say there's no consequences. Because when we screw up, when we mess up, every time I decide I'm not going to do what the Bible says, I'm going to do what I want. It's my turn for a change. You know, and, and, and then I do, there's always consequences. There's always negative consequences when I decide to just, I'm going to do my thing, I'm done doing God's thing. And they're bad. And it's a problem. And it causes problems for me and people around me. And that's true for you as well. If you decide, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. I'm doing my own thing. There's consequences. That's different than condemnation. He says, there is no condemnation. And so what happens is some of the consequences when we, when we sin is, is we lose fellowship with God. We lose rewards in heaven. We lose joy to, in, here and now. We lose effectiveness on the earth. So how do we turn that around? We're in a ditch. We, we're, 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 we're in a bad place. We want a gold medal, right? Here's my, pull it out for my last time. We want a gold medal, right? How do we get a gold medal? How do we change things around? Well, God has a plan for us. He wants us to be freed from where we're at. Uh, and if we're, if we're experiencing defeat and experience victory, five reasons why you can experience the, the thrill of victory. Well, number one is because his love is unconditional. We remind ourselves of that. It's not about God doesn't say, I love you if you're good. I love you if you do a certain thing, if you're, per if you're perfect, if you cross all the T's, dot all your I's. I mean, he just says, I love you, period. And this is an important part of, of getting past the finish line and getting your gold medals is recognizing God is always loving me. It's, it's not something I earn or I work up or I don't have to try to make him happy. God loves me regardless of where I'm at and loves me as much on my best day as on my worst day. Look at what Lamentation says in 322. God's compassion never ends. It is only his mercy, by his mercies that we have been kept from complete destruction. So circle the word never. God's compassion for me it just never ends. God does not reject believers because of the sin and the things that they get caught up in. His love is unconditional. The second reason why we can experience the thrill of victory is because my salvation is based on God's mercy. My relationship with Christ is not based on my performance. It's, it's based on God's grace. Romans 9, 16 says, it doesn't depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. You see, the only hope that you and I have to get into heaven is through God's grace, his mercy. It's not based on, there's, if you're getting into heaven, it's not because you bought your way there. You didn't work your way there. You didn't bluff your way in. The only way you get into heaven is his by God's grace, you go in and you recognize, I can't do it. God, heaven's perfect. I'm certainly not. I missed the mark of God's perfection. But Jesus Christ, when I put faith in him, he's the avenue on, on the way. It's by God's grace through, through Christ. Titus 3, 5 says, he saved us not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. See, my relationship with God is based not on performance, but on God's grace and then number three, because Jesus has already taken my punishment. He's already taken my punishment. You know, it's interesting, in our, in, in our society, we have a law called the law of double jeopardy. You're familiar with that if you watch all the shows on, on cases. And the law of double jeopardy, I th maybe it's created by Alex Trebek, I'm not sure. But <laughs> <laughs> the law of double jeopardy is where uh, you cannot be tried for the same crime twice. You cannot be uh, punished for the same crime twice. And that's, God has the same rule. God says you cannot be punished for the same sin twice. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was punished. Not because of what he did wrong, but because of what we did wrong. And he was punished on that cross. He was crucified on that cross. That was the punishment. That was the punishment. Jesus doesn't need to offer sacrifices each day. Hebrews tells us. 
for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He offered a sacrifice once for all when he gave himself. So he took the, the price for you. He paid the price for you. He took your rap. He served your time. The, the time was death because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus was put to death, crucified for our sin. And so if God comes up to you and says, because of that sin you just did, I'm going to punish you now. What he's really saying is, is that Jesus' punishment wasn't enough. What, what, what happened to him wasn't, uh, wouldn't, wasn't satisfactory. And that's not true. What Jesus did was enough. That's why once you become a Christ follower, you never, it, that's been paid for. That's been paid for. All of your sin was, was paid for. You say, well, what's all of it? Well, not just your past sins, not just presently, but everything since you haven't even done yet. All of that's been taken care of through Christ's sacrifice. Now, that's pretty remarkable to think, well, I, since I haven't even done yet, have, it's, that's already been cleaned, the slate's been cleaned for me. Well, that is true. Some people might be tempted to think, well, then I can do whatever I want then. It's already been taken care of. I can go ahead and steal from my employer. I can lie and cheat on my taxes. I can go have an affair with somebody. It's all been taken care of. But here's the truth is if you have those thoughts, it just means that you really are not a, an authentic believer of Christ because true believers don't have, don't, don't have that attitude. They're grateful for the grace of God. They don't use the grace of God as a license to sin. That's not the attitude that, that we take. Colossians 2.14 says, think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, the old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to the cross of Christ. That's why Jesus said on the cross, he said, one of the last things he said was, it is finished. That Greek word, tetelestai, means that it's all been paid for. It's all completed. There's nothing else that needs to be done. And then Jude 4 says, some godless people have wormed their way in among you saying that God's forgiveness allows us to live immoral lives and distorting the message about the grace of our God in order to excuse their immoral ways and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And so some people, th that's their attitude. And he just says that all that shows is that you're not part of the, of the family of God. If you have the idea that I'm going to use God's grace just to do whatever I want. No, no. The God's grace causes me want to love God. God more, causes me want to serve God more, to be part of what he's doing in this world. You know, in um, Hebrews 12, it says that if we sin intentionally over and over again, and we're never disciplined for that, that actually is proof that we're not part of God's family. Because God disciplines those who he loves, those who are that are part of his family. When, when my kids were little, I disciplined them if they did stuff wrong. But I didn't discipline the neighbor's kids. They could be doing all kinds of things. And I just look out the window, Phew, glad they're not mine, right? <laughs> I don't discipline somebody else's kids. I discipline my own kids. That's true with God. God disciplines his kids. So when you sin intentionally over and over and you're disciplined, there should be, there's nobody likes to be disciplined, but there should be some comfort with that, knowing God loves me. I'm part of his family and that's why he disciplines me. 1 John 2, 2 says, when Jesus served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for God, not only ours, but the whole world. He says, Jesus did it all. He took care of all of our sin problems. He took the punishment so we don't have to. Number four, because Jesus understands my human weakness. He's sympathetic for my, my situation. He knows my frailties. He knows my hangups. He knows what makes me tick. He knows how I'm wired. Jesus Christ he, he's God. He came on earth, lived for 33 years so we could understand who God is, see that God wasn't angry with us, that God loved us. But also it was a way so that we could connect with God. God lived that life. It says that he was tempted in all ways but didn't sin. He experienced all of the frustrations and the challenges of being in frail humanity. Hebrews 4.15 4, says, he understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. And so there's a, symp a sympathy. There's a, I get it. I've been part of humanity. I'm, I'm in this with you together. And that's exciting to know because God is, it's, it's great to have a good teammate, right? I mean, just if, and, and when you're playing, playing a sport and you have 
an ace player, you think, wow, we're probably going to win that one. When you have God, it's not probable, you're going to win. And so you're, you're, you have the thrill of victory coming your way. Number five, because God doesn't hold on to grudges. Psalm 103 says this, it says in the New Living Translation, God will not constantly accuse us or remain angry forever. He has not punished us for all our sins, nor does he deal with us as we deserve. He is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Now, the word fear means respect, that you, you recognize you're part of the family. There's accountability. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, a responsibility. There's love, all of that. And he says that God calls us into this family of relationship. But he, and, and, he, and, and he it's a loving family. It's not dysfunctional. It's not holding things over you and, and a tit for tat. God just constantly is compassionate. And he doesn't hold grudges like maybe maybe some people are used to. You go, well, you know, Andy, what if you've really crossed the line? What if you don't know what I've done? And I don't. But what if I've done this? I mean, I'm pretty far away. I don't know if that's really going to go too well with God. I see myself pretty far away. But God, over and over, no matter what we've done, it says he calls us home. He says, you know what? You can come back. And sometimes we think, oh, it's so much, you know, it's going to be so difficult. But the truth is, it's not complicated. That's what Satan wants to tell you. Oh, yeah, you're, you've got, it's going to be years of coming back to God. The truth is, coming back to God is quick and easy. It's just returning to God. It's just returning back to him. Notice what God says. He says, come back to me, you unfaithful children, and I will what? Beat you up? No, right? That's what sometimes we think. Right, I'm going to get, a, I'm going to get in the, go back to the woodshed there. No, he says, <clears throat> come back to me, you unfaithful children, and I will forgive you for being unfaithful. And so we, when we're sin, when we mess up, we just return to God. God says, I welcome you back. Notice this last verse. He says, no matter how deep the stain of your sin, I... I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. It's kind of like the Clorox bleach of the Bible, right? He says, I can clean it up no matter what it is. I can clean it up. <clears throat> you know, the story of Peter, we saw the defeat, the agony of defeat in his life. But you know, it actually ends very positively. He ends up with the thrill of victory. That's how the story ends. Peter went through all of that and felt terrible of all the things that happened. He denied Christ and, uh, three times. The last time he cursed him. and just He's just in a terrible place. He's weeping. He's ashamed. He thinks that, you know, it's all over. And then on Easter, Easter morning, the uh, three women go to the tomb. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, and they, they show up, and there's, the tomb is empty. There's an angel there, and he says, he's not here. He is risen. And then he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Singles them out. Kind of calls them out. He knows that, you know, where Peter's at, he's in a bad place. He's thinking, you know, I'm embarrassed. I, I can't even face Jesus. He's, you know, I mean... I, if you're, I can't think of us much worse than that, denying Jesus Christ on the night that he's betrayed. You're his best bud. And you say, I don't even know the guy. He's feeling horrible. And so Jesus calls him out and says, you know, he's, he's basically saying it's all good. You're forgiven. Tell the disciples and Peter. You know, it's interesting on the, the, at the Last Supper when Jesus is talking to his disciples. He goes to Peter and he says, you know, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I have been praying for you. He goes, I've been praying for you. And when you are restored, go and encourage your brothers. He knew in advance that he was going to do that stuff. He knew in advance that Jesus, that he was going to be restore him. Jesus knew, I'm going to restore Peter. He'll come back and he'll be stronger from it. He's praying for him. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is praying for you. He's interceding on your behalf. Now, let me ask you a question. If that's true, do you think Jesus, do you think his prayers work? I think they do. I mean, if you want anybody praying for you, wouldn't it be great to have Jesus praying for you? And the Bible says he is. 
He's interceding for you. If you're in a difficult place, if you're experiencing the agony of defeat, Jesus is interceding for you. And Jesus, his prayers come true. And he knew that when Peter, if he, going through this actually would make him stronger, would have, give him a greater story about God's redemptive power in his life, which happened. It did happen. Peter ended up writing first and second Peter. He told his memoirs to a guy named Mark, and that became the gospel of Mark. He's impacted generations and generations of people through his life. And then later on, he's, he's fishing with, with his pals. Jesus has already resurrected and, and shown himself to hundreds of people. And, and here's where a time he comes up to, to Peter, he's, to the disciples, he's on the shore they all notice, hey, that's Jesus. They all go, let's row in. Jesus, Peter's so excited. He goes, I'm swimming in. He leaps out of the boat. He's going to try to beat the boat in. And he goes and he talks to Jesus. And they have really the first private one-on-one -on -one time together. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, he says, uh, Peter, do you love me? Peter goes, I love you, Lord. He goes, do you love me? He goes, I love you, Lord. He goes, Peter, do you really love me? He goes, you know all things. You know I love you. What was he doing? He's restoring him. See, G Peter had denied Jesus three times. Saying, I'm letting you get this right. You can come, you can get all this cleaned up. And I want to use you again. God wants to use you again, no matter where you're at. You know, we get to a place where we think, I don't think I'm usable. You are. But you got to come home. God invites you home. He says, come home today. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. I'm going to pray with you. Our prayer teams, you can come up. You know, when God speaks a word into our life, we're always at a crossroads where we think, am I going to move on this? What will people think of me? What if I can't, what if this is just emotions? What if I can't really follow through with this? All those kinds of things start to happen in our mind. I've been there, I know. But when God moves and you sense, you know what? I really sense God tugging on me today. I want to tell you the response that you need to make is you need to move forward. You need to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust with God's help. By God's grace, I can follow through with this because God will help me. And God invites you to, in, into that place today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pray. Father, I just pray, Father, let your presence come. The power to free people from inhibitions of, and, and fears and doubts of of. Does this really apply to me? And God says, you come home today. God says, I want to restore you. Your place of defeat will be interwoven into the fabric of your story. And God says, I can use you more with that defeat than before I could, than before. Lord, I pray that for those here who feel distant from you, they would pray and they would say, yes, I want to I come home. It's that simple. Would you say, God, I want to return to you. Flood me with your love, your unconditional love and your grace. Help me to forgive. Help me to let go of resentment. Help me to not fall into complacency or convenience. God has a word for some of you. He says, I want to rejoice. I want to return to you the joy of your salvation. Some of you, you're going through this whole thing. Just It's dutiful. You show up. You put on the face, but the truth is the joy is gone. 
Somehow along the road, the defeat sucked the joy out of your life. And God says, I want to I return the joy of your salvation. Lord, I pray for the thrill of victory to be returned. For those who have wandered away, if you're there, just say, God, my heart has become cold. My service is cold. I need to know that, to be reminded and to know of your love for me. That you sympathize with where I'm at. You don't hold grudges. You're, I've, I've, I'm, I don't have to worry about being punished. You're not angry with me. You're compassionate and loving and patient. God says he's patient with you. If you've never invited Christ, or maybe it's been a long time, you're just, why don't I just start there? And if you've never invited Christ into your life, say, Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but I need your forgiveness. I need your grace, and I want to be part of your family. Come into my life. I want to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.